Well, good evening and welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, on behalf of Anne-Marie Slaughter, the president of New America, and Peter Bergen, the director of the National Security Program, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and uh, also welcome uh, any and all of those who are watching us on, uh, on the webcast at home or elsewhere. Uh, my name is Doug Ollivant. I'm a senior national security fellow here at the New America Foundation. And uh, Peter Bergen uh, wishes he could be here but was unavailable tonight. So uh, I, am, uh, I am his stand-in. Uh, we are uh, thrilled and honored to have Anand here tonight. Uh, Anand is a uh, fellow? fellow fellow at the New America Foundation as well, although uh, he spends all his time in New York. So uh, we very, very seldom see each other. Um, we're pleased to have him here tonight uh, to talk about his new book, uh, No Good Men Among the Living, which of course you should all go to Amazon and click buy right now and uh, drive up his sales. Um, Anand, in addition to being a New America Fellow, um, spent a number of years in Afghanistan. How long total? Four years. In total. Four years in total uh, as the correspondent primarily for the Wall Street Journal and the Christian Science Monitor. Um, this is his first book. So we'll uh, let Anand talk for a little bit, and then he and I will uh, have a conversation here on stage, and then we'll turn to our audience for questions. So without further ado. Thanks. Um, I will talk a little bit about the book, uh, give you a little background on how I came to it and some of the main themes in it, and then we'll open it up for a conversation. Uh, I, m my story um, in, in terms of how I got to Afghanistan starts on 9-11, because I was living in lower Manhattan at the time, and uh, the attacks were very close to me. In fact, I lost a couple of good friends in the attacks. I got trapped under a car for a few hours. Um, and, you know, like all of us, it was a pretty traumatic event. And it, it, for, for me, it jarred me out of my complacency, and it had forced me to start paying attention to the world outside of the U.S. Um, and so I followed the war on terror, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, as best as I could. Uh, and I always felt somewhat dissatisfied with um, what I was learning, just because, you know, these are difficult wars to cover. Uh, particularly in Afghanistan, where so much of the country is off limits for, for journalists. And, and so it was something that uh, gnawed at me for, for many years. And finally, in late 2007, I decided to switch careers. I was doing physics and, and chemistry at the time. Uh, switch careers and moved to Afghanistan. Um, and when I got there, uh, the war was in full swing. Uh, at that time, we were just beginning as a country to, to sort of recognize that Afghanistan was a war because we were so focused on Iraq for many years. And uh, when, I, when I landed there, I, I got there without any contacts. Um, uh, I didn't know the language. I didn't really know the first thing about journalism. So in retrospect, it was a pretty bad idea in some respects. But uh, in some ways, it, was actually, it, it actually helped me very much because um, I didn't have the backing of a bureau uh, or I wasn't working for a major or a news organization. So I, I didn't have the money to hire a fixer or a translator or somebody who can who can take me around the country, who can introduce me to Afghans. And so I was forced to improvise. And, and so I learned the language in the course of that year, um, got a motorcycle and went around the country. Ended up living most of that year outside of Kabul in various small villages. And uh, what I learned very quickly is Afghanistan is an extraordinarily hospitable place. Um, one could say this is why they got attacked in the first place. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I would go show up in villages and, and people would uh, bring me into their homes. And so this is what I did for most of that year of 2008. Um, and uh, I also took the opportunity to embed with U.S. troops uh, as much as I could. Um, so that, that year I, I spent time with troops in Kandahar and Wardak provinces. Um, I lived with tribal elders in, in villages. The one thing that was missing from that picture was um, access to the other side, the people that we were fighting. And, and so I did spend some time in 2008 trying to figure out how can I meet the Taliban. And then the problem, of course, is the Taliban has the unfortunate propensity to kidnap the people that they interview, uh, who interview them. And so you have to be very careful about this. Uh, the way I was able to meet the Taliban and one of the main characters in this book is a Taliban fighter. And I follow his life from 2001, essentially, till very recently. Uh, the, the way I was able to meet the Taliban was uh, there was a, a main prison in, near Kabul where a lot of Taliban and al-Qaeda fighters were kept. And there was also a, a major drug kingpin who was, who was in the prison. He was from Malaysia. And he happened to speak Tamil, which is a language I also happened to speak. And so through a Red Cross friend, a Red Cross friend told me, listen, you know, there's this guy, he's a, a drug kingpin, he's living in this prison. Why don't you pose as his relative and just speak Tamil in front of the guards and see what happens? 
So I showed up one day at the prison and I, I said, you know, what the hell, I'll try it. And so I started speaking Tamil to the guards and they didn't know what to do with me and I pointed to the guy's name, you know, there's a list of prisoners that said, that guy's my relative and they said, okay, so they let me into the prison. Uh, and I met him and he was shocked because this poor guy hadn't seen anybody in like three years. So, you know, he was just happy to have a conversation <laughs> with somebody in his native <laughs> language, you know. And so we spoke with each other for a while and it, it so happened that he was housed in this, one block that was separate from the common criminals. Um, and, and it was special because in that block, everybody there except for him was either in the Taliban or in Al Qaeda. Okay, so they're all like senior, senior level people, mostly. Um, and so I would go once a week sneaking into the prison and, and talking to him and eventually he introduced me to Taliban bigwigs that are in the prison. And in this, through this process, by, by the end of the year, I had gotten to know everybody inside the prison. And with, only with their imprimatur was I able to then go out into the field, um, into the you know, countryside, and actually meet Taliban fighters who were actually fighting. Otherwise, I probably would have been kidnapped. So through that, I was able to go. Um, and that's how I met the Taliban commander, who is one of the three characters in this book. Uh, his name is Mullah Cable. Uh, he got that name because he, he used to walk around in the 1990s with a whip, with a metal, metal cable whipping people to get their weapons and to force them to pay taxes. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, when I met him, I, I, um, I was very interested in, I was just interested in what would drive somebody to take up a whip and start whipping people. It seems like the furthest thing uh, from anybody's experience that I can imagine. And um, he actually was interested in telling his story, which um, possibly because I was the first person to ask him about his story. Um, and so, you know, for the next year, we met uh, pretty much two or three times a week. And he was just telling me his life story and then, um, you know, telling me, I went to this village, I fought here, I did this, I was born here, or, you know, I knew this person. I took everything down and then I would go and try to follow up with every single thing he said. I would go to the villages he, he mentioned. I would go and ask, you know, did you know this guy, Mullah Cable? Did he say this thing, you know? Um, and uh, for a while, he thought I was a spy for doing that. <coughs> because you know, the, the sort of Western approach to journalism isn't, uh, isn't there in Afghanistan. So they don't really understand why am I trying to double check everything he's saying. He took it as me not trusting him, which is to an extent true. I didn't actually trust for everything he was saying, so I had to do this. But you know, uh, it took a while for him to be convinced that this is actually necessary for the, if I'm gonna take his story down, I actually do need to go and do these sorts of things. Um, so that was a process in which I got to know a little bit about the Taliban, and I'll explain a little bit about what I think they're actually about and why they're fighting um, soon. But that, that's like how I got to understand a little bit about the Taliban. Uh, after that, um, I, I spent more time in villages in southern Afghanistan. And my purpose there was to try to understand why people were fighting and why people, even people who don't support the Taliban, who aren't with the Taliban, tended to be very dismissive of the Afghan government and be very dismissive of the US forces. And I was interested in understanding why that was the case. Because you often hear that, well, the Afghan government is very corrupt, and, and so this is why people don't like the Afghan government. That wasn't, um, that may have been an, uh, a, a necessary condition to being anti-government, but it, it didn't strike me as being a sufficient one. Because any of you who have traveled to that part of the world knows that many of these governments are corrupt. You know, you have to give bribes in India, you have to give bribes in Pakistan, in Nepal, but not all of these countries have uh, a major insurgency and the government controlling 50 or less than 50% of the country. And so um, I spent a lot of time trying to understand what it is that was animating people and what it is that was um, pushing people away from the US forces and the Afghan government. Um, and the stories that they told me actually shattered my preconceived notions of what this war was about. And I had come in thinking, probably what many, many of you think, that this war was about the United States invading Afghanistan to fight a, a recalcitrant group of uh, fighters who, who did not want the US there because they believed in jihad. And what it turned out to be the case is that it was actually very different. Uh, um, when the US invaded in 2001 and 2002, the entire Taliban, or most of the Taliban, surrendered or collapsed, ceased to exist as a movement and surrendered. Al-Qaeda had fled the country. Most of them got into Pakistan, some of them gone to Iran. 
uh, the reason the Taliban surrendered is not because they were peaceniks or not because they uh, believed that believed in the American project. It's because this is what Afghans had done for the last 20 or 25 years. Right? When you're in a country that's been at war for, for that long, you will learn ways to survive. Uh, when the Russians had left in 1989, a lot of the Afghans who had previously supported the communist government all of a sudden shifted sides and said, we now support the Mujahideen, the holy warriors. And they called themselves Islamists. Uh, Dostum, who was a, a big warlord in Afghanistan, he used to be a communist. He was paid by the communists. After the Russians had collapsed and the, and the Moscow-backed regime in 1991 <coughs> collapsed, he switched sides and he called himself you know, like a Mujahideen fighter, an Islamic fighter. Right? This was, this was a story of Afghanistan for the last 30 years. And this is what happened in 2002 as well. Once the, the Taliban were defeated, and they were defeated very easily and very quickly with a few number, very small number of forces on the ground and overwhelming air power, most of their fighters, rank and file fighters, immediately surrendered. Uh, by January 2002, pretty much the entire rank and file um, had surrendered and the leadership of the Taliban had also surrendered. If you go back and look at some of the news articles from that time, you'll actually see every single day there were um, public ceremonies in which the Taliban were going and, and giving up their weapons to the new government. This is sort of a, a performative action on their part because they were trying to show to the Afghan government, look, we're on your side. We don't, we, we don't want you to kill us, so just leave us alone. Here are our weapons. This had happened when the Taliban had come to power themselves. Uh, the people that they had displaced had done the same exact thing. So this is sort of the pattern for the last 15 or 20 years. And so in 2002, the US forces were on the ground in the country without Al Qaeda, because they had fled the country, and without the Taliban, because they had gone back to their homes and they had surrendered. The problem, however, was that we were there with this ide fix, you know, this, I this idea that the world is divided rigidly into those who are with us and those who are against us. And those sort of rigid categories couldn't be changed in any way. And so when the US forces were there, they expected to find terrorists and they expected to find people who would fight against them. Into that environment um, came a whole host of Afghan warlords and commanders whom we allied with. Uh, and I detail the case in the book of uh, one commander. Um, his name is John Muhammad Khan. And he was somebody who was a Mujahideen commander, meaning he fought against the, the Soviets in the 1980s. Then he became the governor of a province in central Afghanistan named Urzgan. Uh, he was overthrown by the Taliban when they came to power in 1994. And so he spent five or six years plotting against the Taliban, finding a way to get back at them until he was finally arrested by the Taliban, tortured very badly by the Taliban, and kept in prison. Um, he was released um, because of the invasion, and he became the governor of this province, Urzgan. Once he was the governor, uh, he was driven by a number of things. Number one, he was driven by uh, revenge, which, I mean, if any of us had gone through what he had gone through with the Taliban, I think we probably would have felt the same way. You know, the Taliban didn't even let him pray in jail. And it's astonishing when you think about that, as the Taliban being this religious fundamentalist group, didn't even let him pray. Um, they would beat him, they would hang him from the ceiling. And so on one level, he was driven by this animus to get back at people who, who, whom he perceived as being Taliban. So that's uh, on one level. On the second level, um, US forces were there in Urzgan province saying, listen, we know Al Qaeda and the Taliban are here, and we know that they're um, ready to attack US forces and US interests, so can you point us to them? We will pay you money, and we will give you contracts. We will give you whatever you want to do that. So we incentivized his uh, targeting people who may not have necessarily been Taliban. So what ended up happening in 2002 and 2003, almost, and I, I went to Urzgan, I spent many, many, many months in Urzgan, and, and I was charting who it all was, who, who was it that was actually arrested in those years? Who was sent to Guantanamo? Who was sent to Bagram, the main prison near Kabul? Uh, who was killed? And almost to a man, it was people who were not part of the Taliban or who had been part of the Taliban who had tried to switch sides. And all of the intelligence was coming from John Muhammad. So I'll give you a couple of examples, and these are some stories that I, I detail in the book, just to, to, to give you a sense of how this worked. Okay. So one was um, a baker, and his name is Sharafuddin. I met Sharafuddin um, because I lived across the street from his bakery in Kandahar City for, for a few months in 2009. And Sharafuddin was 
82 when I met him. So um, the events that I'm describing, which is 2002, um, he was like 76 or 75 or something. Um, and Sharafuddin uh, was at his bakery one morning when militiamen who were under the control of Gulaga Shurzai, who is a provincial governor of Kandahar province, who was working very closely with uh, US forces at the time, when they showed up and they accused him of being a terrorist. And he said, you know, of course, I'm not a terrorist. I don't know what you're talking about. And so they arrested him. They sent him to Kandahar Airfield, which is the main American prison uh, in Kandahar. And there he was subjected to very bad torture, including electric hooks in his mouth. Um, and then finally he was released from the US. And you know what he told me when, I, when he was describing this, and you know, he went to the doctor after and he showed me medical reports about what had happened to him. He said, the Americans treated me like real guests because once he was transferred from the US to the custody of this Afghan militias, they took him to a secret jail, which was underneath uh, an office building in Kandahar City, and they hung him upside down. And he was hung that way for 23 hours. Uh, he was hung with a second man, uh, who was a tribal elder, uh, who was from a tribe in which, in the 1990s, many people from that tribe had joined the Taliban. So for that reason, this person was also there. So there's two men that were hanging upside down for 23 hours. And a couple of times a day, these Afghan militiamen would come and with thick cables would whip him and beat him. The, by the way, the person who was responsible, responsible for this torture is now living in the US, he's living in Los Angeles. He, uh, there was a Washington Post story, I don't know if you saw, just the other day, he's called like the torturer in chief, right? He was responsible for this um, and he was a, a CIA ally for many years and now he's, he's in LA. It's unclear exactly how he got there, but he was the uh, culprit for this. So he was hung upside down for 23 hours a day. He was whipped and beaten. The man that was next to him uh, ended up dying from his wounds. Um, and um, Shafiullah, he ended up um, being released because he paid a massive bribe to the, to the, uh, the forces that had uh, detained him, so he was sent home. However, because he had paid the bribe, that only further incentivized the torture. So a few months later, he was arrested again. He was hung upside down again, and he was tortured again. This would happen every few months. Um, and, and so, and you know, he, he used to joke with me and tell me, you know, look, I used to put away money for this. Like, you know, like you may put away money for a car. I used to put away money for this torture that would come every few months. Uh, that's one story. A second story is uh, the case of um, Haji Burgat Khan, somebody else I describe in the book, and he's a very important case. He was a very big tribal elder from Kandahar province, and he had He's from the Ishaq side tribe, which has millions of members in Kandahar, Helmand, and, and, and in Pakistan as well. Uh, in early 2002, he declared his support for the US government, for the, for the Afghan government and for the US forces, because he recognized that the Taliban had done nothing for the economy. And in fact, uh, the area he comes from is a poppy growing region. And in, 2000, in the year 2000, the Taliban had banned poppy production. And so the economy was, was devastated in that area. So, these people were very eager for the US forces to come in and ironically to allow poppy production to continue. Um, and, and so he, uh, he was instrumental in getting a lot of rank and file Taliban fighters to go and surrender their weapons to the US. And you can find the news articles about this. These are very public ceremonies where there was truckloads of weapons coming to Kandahar city and you know, they're being given over to the governor of, of Kandahar and uh, there was reporters there taking pictures and all, and all this. Nonetheless, because he was the tribal elder of a millions strong tribe and because he was a pretty prominent uh, drug smuggler himself, um, as were the, all the tribal elders in that region, uh, the governor of Kandahar, whom the US forces were working with very closely, who was also a drug smuggler, who was also an opium grower, rec you know, saw this guy as a threat. And so from him came false intelligence that this person was a member of Al-Qaeda. US forces came in, in in May of 2002 and they killed some people, they killed him and they rounded up 55 people from his village, which is essentially the entire male population of the village. They brought them all to Kandahar Airfield and I interviewed 47 of the 55. And the stories are unanimous that they were, um, they accused the US of torture, of um, three people had broken ribs. Uh, one person was forced on the ground and uh, soldiers walked on their backs. And, and um, eventually they were released and you had a situation in which this area had lost 
the most important tribal elder, the person who was the point of access for millions of people to the government of Afghanistan. And to this day, if you, go, if you were to go to this region, um, which is Western Kandahar, and ask, why are people fighting against the US and the Afghan government, they will mention his name. Of course, there's many other reasons as well. But this was the starting point. Um, and I'll give a, a third example, just to show um, if, you, if you fully buy this idea that the world comes neatly packaged into good guys and bad guys, and that we need to fight who we think are the bad guys to its conclusion no matter what, it can actually lead to absurd situations. Um, and this is the case of somebody named Abdul Rahim Aljanko. Uh, Aljanko is a Syrian. Uh, he grew up in an abusive home in, in the UAE in Dubai. And he got the idea, this is, now we're talking like 1997, 1998, he got the idea that, you know what, if I go to Afghanistan and I declare asylum from Afghanistan, then I can be, I, I can portray myself as, an, as a refugee from the Taliban. And people were doing this, in fact, right? Particularly Hazars from Pakistan were actually going into Afghanistan and then going to Western embassies and, and and, or going to the West and declaring themselves as refugees. So he got on a plane and landed in Afghanistan in 1999. The Taliban was in control. Uh, of course, he got out there, and he was a 19-year-old kid or something. Um, immediately, he got arrested. And he was an Arab who was in Afghanistan. And the Taliban said, well, what is an Arab doing in Afghanistan? So they handed him over to al-Qaeda, who had training camps in the country at the time. He was handed over to al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda was very suspicious. Who is this Arab guy who had come into the country without our knowledge and sort of talking about asylum? And so they started interrogating him. And then they started torturing him. Um, they um, did simulated drowning, they electrocuted him, and finally forced a confession out of him, which is caught on videotape, in which he said, okay, I am an agent of the CIA and Mossad, and I'm sent here to kill Osama bin Laden. So they got the confession, and then they handed him over to the Taliban, and the Taliban put him in jail. Fast forward to 2001. <coughs> the Taliban is defeated, the US forces sweep in. Now you have this prison in Kandahar, in which you have hundreds of prisoners, and in particular, I think seven or eight non-Afghans, I mean, mostly Arabs, who are in prison. And the locals didn't know what to do with them. And so they went to the Americans and they said, listen, we have you know, these seven or eight guys who are in prison. What do you want to do? All of them got transferred wholesale from Taliban custody into US custody. Um, Al Janko was then transferred to Guantanamo. And he spent a number of years in Guantanamo. In 2002 or 2003, I don't remember the exact year, uh, uh, John Ashcroft, in, in a press conference, uh, released the video of Al Janko, the, the video of his confession at the hands of uh, Al Qaeda, but with the audio off. And he said, Look here, this is an example of how we're making progress on the war on terror. And so even when, they were, even when we were wrong, we were sort of uh, perpetuating the same mistakes. I don't know. And so through these types of uh, circumstances, there became a real uh, sort of sentiment against the Afghan government and against the US forces. And the, everything I've described so far is um, about people who are not actually with the Taliban. But this is also happening um, against people who are with the Taliban. So I'll give one final example. There's a person named Mullah Ahmed Shah. And he was a Taliban commander in the 1990s. After 2001, he had surrendered. Um, there was, again, a public ceremony where he had given over his weapons, and he had signed a document, and, and reporters were there, and he was living at home. The Afghan government <coughs> arrested him and said, you have more weapons. We want, we want them. Where are they? And he said, I don't have any weapons. So they, they took him. They hung him upside down again. They tortured him. They beat him. And they wouldn't let him go until he gave weapons. And so what he did is he asked his family to go and sell all of their livestock and sell part of the land to raise money to buy weapons on the black market. So they bought the weapons, and they handed it over to the Afghan government. So he was released. But of course, the moment. You, you play their game and you say, okay, I'm going to give you weapons, they're going to keep arresting you. And so that's what happened. So every three months, you know, he was arrested and this procedure uh, repeated itself. Until finally, he fled to Pakistan. He rejoined the Taliban. And by this point, 2004, 2005, the Taliban, because of these sorts of circumstances, were reconstituting themselves as an insurgency. By 2006, we had a full-fledged insurgency on our hands. Once the Taliban had reconstituted itself, you know, um, and, and they were able to talk to 
villagers and say, look, this is what the U.S. is doing. This is what the Afghan government are doing. And it would resonate. That doesn't necessarily mean that once they would constituted themselves, they, didn't, they actually did the same things that the U.S. were doing. They were summarily executing people. They were actually taking people and, um, you know, without trial and killing them. They were uh, accusing people of being American spies when it wasn't the case. But, you know, once an armed group gets reconstituted, once they have the weapons, it's very, very hard to turn that back. And that's the problem. That's really the tragedy of what's happened in the last few years is that now we have the Taliban on the one side who's strong. They're not strong enough to take power, but they're very strong in large parts of the countryside. You have the Afghan government, and then you have civilians who are caught in between. And that's the story of the third person in this book. Uh, her name is Hila. She's a housewife. Uh, she's from Kabul. And she was born and brought up there. And, so she, and she married uh, somebody who was a communist at the time. And so they're very progressive and modern. And they had um, ideas that are very different from what we may associate with Afghanistan. During the Civil War in the mid-1990s, Hila was forced to flee with her family to the rural province of Urzgan. And then for the next 10 or 12 years, she found herself caught in between these various sides, um, caught between the Taliban, caught between the US, uh, the U.S. forces, the Afghan government, and trying to find a way to navigate uh, through that and survive. And I think her story is important because it really encapsulates what the experience of so many Afghan civilians in the areas where the war is being fought actually is. And, and that's uh, what I hope to communicate with this book. Great, thanks very much. Um, as I read the book, what impressed me was the incredible, almost Byzantine-like nature, not only of the government, but of the society as a whole. Can you talk to me about how you went about unraveling all these various you know, alliances, you know, families, people that are married into, your tribal ties, who's in charge, who you have, you know, it, it, uh, it struck me as much more sophisticated than even those of us who were there really fully understood at the time. Or maybe not sophisticated, but certainly intertwined. It's very intertwined, and it's a society that works very differently from the way our society works. So it took me a long time to learn it. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I probably still don't know it entirely, you know? Um, but it, it is the case that when you go and you live in a village, um, you can learn these things much more quickly than if you read it anywhere, not that you shouldn't read the book, but, um, or that if you sit in, in Kabul or anywhere else. Because, um, you know, when you, ha when you have to master the various tribal ties and, and linkages between families, because it depends on your very safety, you'll master it very quickly. And I, I learned this a number of times. You know, I would be introduced to somebody in a village, and I didn't know who he was. And I'd have to sort of somehow garner from who else is in the room and who's talking to him, you know, what side this person may be on. And, and the society is, is this Byzantine, not because of anything unto itself, it's, it's because, you know, it's been caught in a war for 20, 35 years, essentially, right? And or at the time I was doing it, 30 years. And, and so alliances shift often. often. Um, alliances are, are weak um, because, you know, you never know when the situation is going to change. Um, and so it requires mastering a whole set of concepts about, you know, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And that's something I try to do in, in the book and in my reporting. Um, as a retired military officer, one of the passages I really enjoyed was your uh, recreation of the Battle of Terenkot. Um, Terenkot's the, you know, the early battle. Uh, Karzai, you know, the, the Americans are kind of here. I guess we're, we're starting to bomb already. Karzai comes in from Pakistan with some special forces advisors. The Taliban learn that he's in country and come to get him. Um, and I think you do a very interesting job juxtaposing the, the two commanders on each side. If you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. The Battle of Tirankar took place uh, in November of 2001. And it was really sort of the last stand of the Taliban. Um, because at this point, Kabul had already fallen. And all that was left was the south. And if you remember, at the time, we were allied with the Northern Alliance, who are from northern Afghanistan. They don't really have the support in the south. And so they couldn't march into the south of Afghanistan. That's like, that was a Taliban stronghold. And so the US was desperately, desperately looking for an ally in southern Afghanistan in order to kick out the, the Taliban from Kandahar city, which is their capital. Um, Hamid Karzai, who was somebody who has been plotting against the Taliban regime for a number of years, decided to risk everything um, shortly after the bombing commenced, get on a motorcycle with a couple of his friends, and sneak into Kabul, uh, sneak into Afghanistan, sorry. And he decided to go to Urzgan province, which is really kind of like a random province in the central of, 
part of the country, but the reason he went there is because a lot of the Taliban leadership had come from there. So he, his thinking was, if I can go into Urzgan, and if I can spark a tribal uprising, then the Taliban will be uh, overthrown. And so that's what he did. He got into Urzgan province. He ended up on a mountain, I described this in the book, and he was surrounded by Taliban fighters, and he called in the CIA, and they sent in um, special forces who came in, and they like, picked him up, and they brought him to Pakistan. They went back into Urzgan province uh, uh, some days later with the special forces. And the Battle of Tirankot is uh, the battle of a city, this capital of Urzgan province, which had fallen. The Taliban had lost this uh, city. Um, and Karzai and U.S. Special Forces were in this city, and the Taliban were marching into the city to try to retake it. And this is sort of the central battle of probably the whole war. Um, and so I had heard about this battle um, from Afghans, because I had spent a lot of time in this area. And so I was uh, you know, getting a lot of sort of interviews about like, how did it feel like to be in this battle, and what, what did you think was happening? But uh, I was sorely missing the American perspective, and so I, I sought out Jason Amarine, who uh, was a Special Forces commander, who was uh, the leader of the U.S. side of that battle. And he was here in D.C., and I met him, and we, we spoke. And you know, he told me we were thinking about the, the other side, the Taliban. Like, what were they thinking? Why were they coming in? Did they think they actually had a shot against the world's greatest military superpower? Um, and he, at one point, he told me, you know, I would love to. To, to understand what my counterpart, I mean, the Taliban fighter, was actually thinking. What was he, what was going through his mind as he was, as, as they were coming in? Because what happens is hundreds of trucks are driving in to Tirinko to try to retake this town from the Americans. And so I thought, you know, I should see if I could find this guy, the guy, the Taliban fighter, the commander who was actually on the other side, who was leading this charge. The amazing thing about Afghanistan is that you can actually do this. Um, because everybody's connected through networks. You know, you can find people through cousins and brothers. And, you know. and so I spent some months, and I, I, I looked around. And, and lo and behold, this guy who had led, the, had led the battle was still there. He was still around. He was still fighting. He was still the Taliban. Um, and I, did, you know, I had to call in a lot of favors, et cetera. And I finally got to meet the guy. And you know, I had to tell him, I'm not going to ask you anything about post-2002. I'm not a spy. I'm not going to ask you anything. I just want to know about something that happened 10 years ago. And he's like, OK, fine. I'll, I'll talk to you. Uh, and so I met him. And, and uh, he started telling me his story about it, <coughs> why he decided to go uh, and retake this town. And that's what's described in this book, is the battle from both sides, is the battle from the side of the, the US forces and the side of the, the Taliban fighter. Um, and the extraordinary thing, the thing that I learned from all this is that the reason this guy was fighting, even though I disagree with it, even though I don't think that his vision of what a good Afghanistan is, you know, I don't think his vision of Afghanistan is actually a good one, something that we should strive to. On some level, you know, he was fighting because he thought, maybe he was misguided, right? But he thought that he was defending his country. He, he didn't, he had never heard of 9-11. He, he, you know, and the, the sort of propaganda that he was getting from the Taliban uh, newspapers was that, uh, the U.S. was just, for no reason, attacking Afghanistan because they wanted to convert everybody to Christianity. They wanted to take all the, you know, the whatever wealth there was in Afghanistan. They wanted to take all of this, and you need to go there and defend your country. And that's what he did, you know. And, and so he, he, he and dozens of other commanders like him, they got on their trucks, and they drove up to this town, and they tried to defend it. Of course, they don't have air power on their side, and so they were defeated very easily, very quickly. And he fled off to his home village, and he had a crisis of conscience. And he was like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I in the Taliban? And he decided to quit the Taliban in 2000, uh, right after this battle. And he spent three years as a farmer, uh, mostly growing poppies, because everybody in his village grows poppies. Uh, he was doing that until uh, John Muhammad Khan, who is one of the characters in my book, um, started cracking down on poppy cultivation. Now, he had his own poppy fields. But if you have your own poppy fields, and you have the ear of the US military, the best thing to do is crack down on other people's poppy fields, because that'll, rise up, that'll drive up the prices. So that's what he did. And his fields were one of the fields that were, what are, were destroyed. And so he went back and joined the Taliban. Um, let's talk about a couple of the criticisms of your book. Some, uh, some reviewers have said that um, you don't really address the role of Pakistan, that you make this a totally internally Afghan internal problem, crisis, uh, event. And that you uh, you overlook the role, you know, the, the shadowy figure, the hand inside the glove, 
um, that uh, many people believe Pakistan can be. Talk to me a little bit about your view of the role of Pakistan in the country and why it doesn't play a very prominent role in your book. Sure, I, I think Pakistan is very important in the Afghan insurgency. But I think that a lot of commentators who have been talking about Pakistan have actually got it wrong. And, and, and what I mean by that is that there is a narrative out there about Pakistan, which is that Pakistan is sort of you know, the person that's controlling the, the, the puppet strings here. Uh, and that the people in Afghanistan are fighting because pa Pakistan is telling them to fight. I actually don't think that's accurate. I think that there are local grievances and, and local problems rooted in the, things that I, the sort of things that I've talked about, which have actually set the stage uh, for the insurgency. Once the insurgency started gaining steam, that is actually when Pakistan um, shifted, you know, basically put their weight behind uh, these various actors. Because if you actually look at the record, in 2001 to 2003, Pakistan was on the fence. They were actually supporting the U.S. in a number of raids. They raided the Haqqani Madrasa, for those of you who know who Jalaluddin Haqqani is. It was very, nowadays we think of Jalaluddin Haqqani as sort of the veritable arm of the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Agency. In 2002, that wasn't the case. Um, and in fact, I have a piece out right now that describes this that you, that you should uh, look up. Um, in 2002, Pakistan um, was conducting raids with the US military in Miram Shah of North Waziristan. They had taken the control of the Haqqani Madrasa away from the Haqqani family and given it to tribal elders in that area. Um, they had arrested Sirajin Haqqani, who was, who came, who today is the leader of the Haqqani network. At that time, he was in his early 20s. And the reason they had done so is the same reason why they had arrested um, Khalid Sheikh uh, Mohammed, the same reason why they had arrested um, Mullah Zaif, if you know who he is, and Mullah, um, Mullah um, Hayrullah Khairkhwa, these are major Taliban figures that Pakistan had arrested in that period and had handed over to the U.S. government. And the reason is, and I've talked to Pakistani officers who describe this, is that there was a moment in that, in that period where they felt like they could, uh, there's another way in which they could influence events inside Afghanistan. Uh, at that time, they saw the Afghan government as sort of open, that um, they had a chance to influence things. If they could convince the United States not to back the Northern Alliance to the hilt, if they can convince the United States not to back certain political actors who are seen as being pro-India and pro-Iran to the hilt, that they could actually um, meet their objectives without having to support the Taliban. By 2003, by 2004, that turned out to be not the case. That in fact they saw that they can't do that, and and the only way they saw they can meet their strategic objectives is to back the Taliban, and so the Taliban was already starting up as an insurgency at that time, and so then they supported them. The way they support them, I think, is different from the way that it's been characterized in uh, in, in some other accounts. The Tal uh, Pakistan doesn't fund the Taliban, or if they do, we have no evidence of this. There's no evidence anywhere that Pakistan funds the Taliban. What Pakistan does is it allows the Taliban leadership to live in Pakistan and to function, and they exert the influence by, by arresting certain people at certain times to sort of like push the course of the insurgency in one way or the other. Um, I didn't talk about this as much in my book because my book is really about why the war exists as it does today. It's not why the war is perpetuating itself, and Pakistan is definitely uh, a major case of why the war is perpetuating itself. But why the war actually exists, I think, is not actually about Pakistan. It's about our policy, and it's about Afghan government policy inside Afghanistan. Uh, Another critique of the book has been that uh, you're maybe a little too sympathetic to the Taliban, that you uh, soft pedal some of their abuses, um, don't, really, uh, you know, don't really give full depth to you know, the evil that they're doing in the country as they you know, resurge. In, 2003 to five or six. Um, talk about that if you could. Sure. Um, I think that's, that's actually not accurate. I mean, I have a whole chapter on Taliban abuses in, in the book. But I, I think there's a distinction to be made between the conditions in which, under which the Taliban were able to reconstitute themselves, which I think we largely um, play, the role, play the role in, and the behavior of the Taliban, which is on them. Those are, these are two different things. You know, and the real tragedy of what's happened in the last 10 years is we have allowed the Taliban to reconstitute themselves. Okay? The Taliban don't offer a, a viable future for this country. They don't, right? But the problem is by pursuing certain policies and by, by, by thinking about the war on terror in a certain way, 
we've allowed these, these, this, this group, which wasn't very popular, which was at the nadir of its popularity in 2001, to, to research. And that's the story of the book. That doesn't mean that I'm being soft on the Taliban. It means that I'm, I'm being hard on us for allowing the Taliban to get to where they are. Following up on that, there's a, you know, a popular you know, trope or conception or you know, saying in America that the reason that Afghanistan went bad in 2006 and 2000 is you know, we took our eye off the ball by turning to Iraq. That by late 2002, the entire US government was focused on Iraq. The intelligence assets were pulled out and pushed to Iraq. The special forces specialized in the Middle East and South Asia region were pulled out of there and focused on Iraq. As I read your book, it struck me that you kind of uh, problematize, at the very least, that thesis. Um, you seem to indicate that you know, the, the counter, that counterfactual really isn't true, that if we had kept doing what we were doing in Afghanistan, if, at the very least it would have been the same, or it might have been even worse had we had more forces there to, to do this in the wrong way. Talk to me about uh, what you think about that, and if you think that's an accurate characterization of what you're saying. Well, this is actually one of those uh, examples of uh, where I've gone in with preconceived notions to have them overturned by actually going and talking to Afghans. Because I, I, I don't think it's the case that we lost Afghanistan because we paid too much attention to, to Iraq. Uh, we lost Afghanistan before the Iraq war even started. We lost Afghanistan in 2002, um, and which, it was during a period in which we had all of our attention on the country. Uh, we lost the country, we lost the war in Afghanistan because we went in there with uh, this idea of the war on terror of a rigidly d d distinct set of categories of good guys and bad guys. And that once somebody was a, a bad guy, there was nothing they could do to come into the good guy category, which belied the, the history of the last 20 or 30 years in which it was always shifting back and forth. And that was the fundamental problem. And so the, you know, the Taliban, uh, you know, and I chart this, in the book of all the Taliban leadership who had tried to surrender in various places at various times. And by December of 2002, uh, after a lot of people had been killed, after a lot of tribal communities had been marginalized, and after a lot of Taliban leaders had had their uh, attempts at reconciliation rebuffed, they reconvened in Karachi in December of 2002 for a last ditch effort to try to figure out a way to connect with the Afghan government. And again, this is, they didn't do this because you know, they believed in the US project or they believed in the Afghan government. They did this because they were utterly defeated at the time. They had no choice. And so in, in this meeting in, in December 2002, they took a vote. And everybody was there except Mullah Omar, who was in hiding. Um, but every, every single person who was like major, you know, com, uh, military commander or cabinet member from the 90s regime was there in this meeting. And, and they said, OK. We know that the government is very hostile against us, but let's take a vote and, and let's see, should we try to go to the mountains and fight or should we try one last time to reconcile? And the vote came down in the favor of one last time to try to reconcile. And so they sent two emissaries to Kabul at the time. But this is Kabul 2003 when everybody in the world believed that we, the war was won. There was no reason. You only want to negotiate when you feel like you're losing. That's the problem, right? And, and they, everybody felt like they had won. So there was no need, there was no, incentive to negotiate. So these Taliban, uh, to these two representatives came to Kabul. They were rebuffed. They came back to, uh, to, to, um, Afghanistan, uh, to Pakistan. And already you were seeing a groundswell of support for some sort of response to the predation of the Afghan government and to the US forces. And the two sort of combined in 2003, 2004. This is a story that's independent of anything to do with uh, 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 Iraq. You know, if we had paid more, if we had put more forces and more attention there, I worry that we would have only had more night raids and more killings. I guess the, my last question before we uh, we move to uh, to the audience question. Aside from noting, you've got to be the first person who told me that you know the war in Afghanistan is because the Taliban were too hospitable. That's that's great. Um, <laughs> Is, uh, you know, how much do you think this book is about bad policy? And how much of this is about the fact that there's something in American culture, uh, the American, that just doesn't lend itself to this? Um, I, mean, I guess I'll prejudice my statement. I've said a lot that you know, Americans are, are really, really good at this kind of thing, except for the fact that we're impatient, overly optimistic monolinguists. Um, you know, 
how, how, much, how much of this is about policy and how much of this really is just about the, the fundamental character of Americans? You know, we are, we're a monolingual people, and we're that for a reason. You know, if you grew up in Kansas, you can drive fun 500 miles in any direction, and you can speak perfectly good English, at, you know, at least until you get you know, in East Texas. But, um, it, sorry, I, I spent time there. It's okay. Um, <laughs> So you know, how much of this is about America and its role in the world, and how much of this is about policy at the, uh, in, in 2001, 2002? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. I, I think at the end of the day, and I don't talk about this here, but I think it's worth mentioning that it is about America and its role in the world, um, because that's what shapes and forms policy. Um, it's not just that we, we didn't have the right knowledge. You know, We were there, we didn't have the right knowledge. But the question is, why didn't we have the right knowledge? I mean, the British, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, had all sorts of knowledge about the countries they were invading. Um, why didn't the U.S. have the right knowledge? You, we said something before about American exceptionalism. I think that plays a very powerful role in all this, in, in the sense that there's this idea that what the U.S. does, ipso facto, is good. And that's, that's problematic in a number of levels, but it's also problematic because it shoots the U.S. in, its foot, in the foot, as we see in Afghanistan, right? Because we ally with person X, that means that person X is a good actor. Uh, you see this uh, discourse today even in Afghanistan because we're right now, you know, there's a debate about what the true presence is going to be in the country post-2014. And, and, you know, if you look at the people that we've allied with, and I don't mean the central government, because I actually think the central government is less important than the people in the countryside who are going to be partnering with the CIA and the special forces for coming years their human rights record isn't any better than the Taliban's. But that's not part of the conversation because they're, they are our guys, and that's part of the problem. And I think that's ultimately, at the end of the day, is what this is about. And uh, the sort of misperceptions and the failures of, of, of knowledge, et cetera, are a consequence of those things. Great. All right, at this point, we'll, we'll turn to our audience. Um, you just think, you know, raise hands, please. A, wait on me to call for you. Um, to uh, identify yourself, and if you have a you know, relevant affiliation or experience um, and you want to add it, that would be great. And three, please make your questions brief, and a question um, you know, has a question mark on the end and usually ends in a raised voice. Please, questions, not comments, commentary, et cetera. Ask real questions that our, their guests can answer. I know there's lots of experience in the room, but he, he didn't come to hear commentary. He, he's here for questions. Uh, so with that, where are Right here in the front, please. Wait, please wait for the microphone. Uh, Cynthia Schneider from Georgetown University. Thank you. It's really fascinating. A couple of quick questions. Um, what could we have done differently that that would have been better beyond beyond you know obviously thinking we're right and and everyone else is wrong and doing that? But I'm thinking more. I mean, it's so ironic that we then pursued the policy of negotiating with the Taliban, which never seemed to me to be the right thing to do. Could, would it have made a difference? Could we, could we instead have supported civil society groups and supported youth and, you know, because obviously they're there, they're very strong as we've seen from, from the election. I'm particularly interested in culture and media. I know we've done successful things supporting media. I wonder what you uh, think about that. But basically what, what would be your prescription based on this for doing things better and differently? And where does the negotiating with the Taliban fit into that? Well, you know, the, as I said before, these political groups will only want to negotiate when they're beat. So as willing as the Taliban was in 2001 and 2002 to negotiate, I think they're a lot less willing today to negotiate. There's elements of the Taliban that are, will negotiate because they recognize that there's no end in sight. They're not going to march into Kabul and take over the country. Right? It's just not a realistic possibility. But there's other groups in the Taliban who say, you know what, the US forces are leaving in 2014, or the majority of them are leaving. So why don't we try our luck and try to take, take the country and try to revert it to things in the 1990s, right? Um, and, and so, but again, also it's worth pointing out that what the US and the Afghan government are proposing for the Taliban is not actually negotiations, it's actually surrender. They're saying, accept the Afghan constitution, give up your weapons, and then we'll let you live in peace. That's a, that's a surrender. Right? That's, not a, that's not negotiation. Negotiations means you go to the table and two sides have to give. That's not happening, but it, I think it's unlikely to happen because the Taliban are, are, are stronger now. They're not like, in the position they were in 2002. 
And what was your other question? Um, what could we have done differently? Instead of focusing, as we have done for the last seven, eight years, on negotiating with the Taliban, and instead, what if we had focused on supporting civil society more, supporting the emerging political parties, the youth activists, who are obviously very strong, or, you know, because they turned up at the election? Well, I think if the U.S. was serious about counterterrorism, it would have been serious about nation building. And there's a contradiction between the two that's been inherent in the U.S. mission from day one. What's happened is that the United States has supported warlords and strongmen and power brokers in the countryside who've actually weakened the Afghan state. As long as that's the case, and, and the weak Afghan state ultimately is the reason why, one of the reasons why we have this insurgency, right? So we should have gone in until the ones, if we were serious about building the Afghan state, we should have built the Afghan state. We shouldn't have had a nominal state in Kabul while supporting these power brokers in the name of fighting terror. That's been the problem. And, I think, and unfortunately, I think we haven't learned that lesson because that's still the problem. Even after 2014, special forces and CIA are going to stay in the country, most likely. And who are they going uh, to partner with? They're going to partner with power brokers who are competing with the central state um, you know, for resources and funds, and, and, they have, and that's going to contribute to the weakening of the Afghan state. In the long run, that's what's actually going to ferment in, uh, insurgency. The glasses right behind her. Hi, Sasha Kapadia. Thank you for this talk. Uh, I spent the greater part of two years at the Fletcher School studying Afghanistan issues and did quite a bit of research on disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. And so m this is a related question, I guess. Um, as, as you know, the DDR strategy only came about in 2003. And so um, if we had defeated the Taliban, um, and granted, leaders went off and found refuge uh, across the border, but there were a great many who wished to move on with their lives and give up violence. And so, but there was nothing for them to do. There was no alternative to, to building a livelihood. And so um, this question is, you know, does D DDR doesn't work? Does it work? What could have been implemented at the time that would have actually given people incentives um, to give up violence and, and find new ways to live? Uh, DD I think DDR, which is the, the first uh, disarmament program that was done by the UN and, and other agencies in the early years, fundamentally doesn't work. And the the main reason why it doesn't work is because if you are supporting one set of actors who will refuse to disarm and you will accept the fact that they refuse to disarm, then selectively forcing certain groups to disarm is not a viable solution. And that's what actually happened from 2002 to 2005 or 2006 before DIAG, right? Is that they were going and telling everybody to disarm, okay? But they were only and, you know, flexing their muscle for certain groups and not for other groups. And, you know, there's a... Just the other day, I was talking to a friend who is um, now in the United Nations, and um, he was telling me the story about this warlord who is in southeastern Afghanistan. I write about this guy. Um, I just wrote about a, a piece about the Haqqani Network the other day, um, which you should look up in Tom Dispatch. And uh, I talk about one of the reasons why the Haqqani Network arose and is because we not only rebuffed uh, his attempts at reconciliation, but we actually targeted him at a time when we could have won him over. Um, and the reason we did that is because we were allied with a different warlord named uh, Pachak Khan Zadran, PKZ. He was a major strongman in southeastern Afghanistan. Uh, in 2005, he ran for parliament. And so one of the rules of running for parliament is that you have to you know, give up your weapons, right? Uh, and so the UN had sent people to, to see him and they said, listen, we know you're running for parliament, but you have to give up your weapons because that's the law of Afghanistan. You can't run for parliament if you have all these weapons and militiamen under you. Uh, and you know, he said, and he, and as this conversation was taking place, there were armed men standing around. Okay, and he said, "Well, you know, I don't have any weapons. I, I don't know what to tell you. I can go into Pakistan and buy. I tell my son to go to Pakistan to Dara al and buy weapons if you want, and then you know, I can hand them over." The young guy was like, "Okay, if that's what you need to do. Do that. That's fine. We just need to have you on paper saying that you don't have any weapons." You know, this, was ha this occurred again and again and again. And the reason is because these people who we were trying to disarm are also valuable counterterrorism partners. You can't selectively disarm people, and this is the problem. Um, and I think this generally is a problem with uh, a lot of this surrendering of the Taliban, is that, you know, there was a mood in the country, very 
and you know, I could, I could totally sympathize with this mood, which is that you know, you have these people who are in the regime, in a very brutal regime in the 1990s, wanting to surrender. Why should they surrender? Send them to, you know, send them to court. There's human rights violations committed. Send some of them to the Hague. You know, I mean, the problem though is that if you only send them to the Hague, or you send them to human rights, uh, or send them to courts, but you don't send the guys that we're supporting to the courts, then it becomes a political issue, right? It doesn't, be, you know. Just, uh, well, one of the Taliban told me justice selectively applied is not justice at all. And I, I do think that's, that's correct in the sense that you have to send them all or you can't send them any of them. And, that, and if, you, if you take the, the middle road and just send the guys that we support, you know, sort of absolve them and send the other guys, then you're going to create the seeds for conflict and that's what happened. Right here, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Please wait for the mic. Uh, yes, Robin Rafel from the State Department. Um, this is a related question. Uh, a lot of people now say that if uh, at the original Bonn conference they would have included more Pashtuns and Taliban who were willing to come to the table and, and uh, participate in a discussion about uh, the future of Afghanistan, that a lot of this could have been avoided. What do you think about uh, that proposition? I think it would have been the right move to include everybody in the Bonn conference. Every section of society, including the Taliban, Hikmatyar, um, you know, the civil society, right? Not that I necessarily think that, not that I would want the Taliban's proposals to win the day, of course, but in terms of what had come afterwards, I think that we should have included everybody, not just in the Bonn Conference. I mean, that was the first step, okay? But, you know, okay, so perhaps that was the mood at the time. This is the Bonn Conference of December 2001, so, you know, there was a mood of triumphalism and the Taliban are defeated. But we had many opportunities after that as well to do that, and, and, and we did not, and that, that's uh, you know, the real problem. Great. We had another question over here. Yes, ma'am. No white. Hi, Tatiana Maxwell. Um, I, I wonder if you could spend a little time elaborating on the question of hospitality being, um, you know, how we got in this mess in the first place, because I think that you are not the first person I've heard um, to um, put that idea forward. But also, I think, uh, with regard to that, um, if maybe you could spend a little bit of time talking about the elemental differences you see between the pre-2001 um, Taliban and the reconstituted Taliban. Yeah, I was only, ha I was, uh, only half serious when I was saying that the, uh, <laughs> hospitality is the reason. I, I, I actually think that, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, in the question, why did Mullah Omar throw the country away for this one guy? Especially when you, when you get into some of the, and you've talked to a lot of the Taliban leaders, and you get into, a lot of them are publishing memoirs, by the way, now, of that period. And, and there was a lot of uh, hostility towards bin Laden among the Taliban leadership. You know? And, and uh, Mullah Omar himself famously said that uh, Osama bin Laden was like a chicken bone, you know, caught in my throat. I could neither, neither swallow him or spit him out. And I think it actually, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, I think it actually has less to do with hospitality and it has more to do with questions of legitimacy because the Taliban were really sort of uneducated, uncultured clerics. They were people who, they were parvenus, you know? They were, they were people who had not, they were not, um, you know, not like in Iraq where there's people who are like ayatollahs that are, you know, very important. This is not the case. These are very like simple people. And you know what you see again and again in the discourse and in the writings and interviews of these original Taliban is that they were very cognizant of the fact that they had taken over a country that had just been in civil war, in which, by the way, like every norm of society had been broken down. And can you just imagine? Like people are raping each other on the street. You know, every time you went to get like groceries, you risked being pulled out. You, you have got children; they can be taken out and raped. Uh, right in front of you, you can be killed. I mean, this is this, the level of the breakdown we're talking about. And so a lot of these guys were saying, you know, well, we need to boil things down to the bare essentials. Um, but they were very s simple students. They were not what we call in the region Malawis. They were not like educated clerics. They were just religious students. Many of them hadn't even completed their education. And so Mullah Omar displayed throughout the course of his reign a, a very acute uh, sense of the fact that he was not uh, the he was not a, a religious leader in the, in the traditional mold. He was somebody who was underqualified. And so what ended up happening is that every step of the way in which something could have gone in two directions, something could have gone in the sort of like more sane way or like blowing up the Buddha's way, you know, he went in that direction to try to shore up his Islamic credentials. Obviously that backfired on them. But I think that's actually at the core of why uh, they were 
supporting Bin Laden. There's a great book uh, called Delivering Osama by one of the Taliban insiders. I don't know how much of it's true, okay, because it was written in 2006, but he paints a compelling picture of the fact that there was a consistent bloc within the Taliban who recognized strategically that holding Bin Laden in the country is going to bring ruin upon their own movement, and so they had done many things to try to avert that, but Mullah Omar is always balancing these two sides. He's balancing that side versus balancing the clerics in the country and the, his imagined ummah who he thought would actually be upset that he was handing over a Muslim to a non-Muslim country. I think that's more important than the, just the question of Pashtun Wali and, and, and hospitality. She asked about pre-9-11 pre and reconstituted Taliban. Right. Uh, um, you know, because of the breakdown in, in the mid-90s, um, the, the Taliban ha had a heavy emphasis on what they would term, and I think, you know, like Talal al-Assad, the, the social theorists would call like virtuous practice in the sense of like doing certain activities that were, that were good in and of themselves in terms of they were worried about like, you know, how do you carry a beard, how, you know, how big is your turban, you know, music, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the post-2001 Taliban, they're much more diverse, and they're coming, they're responding to a different set of circumstances. They're not responding necessarily to the breakdown of society. So the, the imperative is not to boil things down to the Islamic uh, essentials. The imperative is nationalism, or what they think of as nationalism, or defending their territory. So if you look at a lot of the Taliban ideology, a lot of Taliban propaganda, it's about defending their country against invaders. Of course, they're still an Islamist. But you do see circumstances you know, across the board. There's a great documentary that Al Jazeera just put out where a reporter went and embedded with the Taliban in Logar province, um, where you know, the guys have, none of them have beards. Um, they're very different from the pre-2001 version. They're still oppressive. There's still, you know, there's still not a group that we want in power, but they are different in that respect. Great. In the very back. Thanks. Can you hear me? Thanks. Uh, it was a great book. I read the book. Kevin Pettit from uh, George Washington University. I have some time in Afghanistan. As a matter of fact, I have some time with uh, Doug Oliver in Afghanistan. And I think we were there in the same time. Although if you had a beard and you were riding a motorcycle, I'm just glad you didn't shoot me. <laughs> right? Because that's what I thought. That's what I'm we glad all you didn't thought. shoot me either. <laughs> Inter <laughs> interestingly, that w um, you know, I, one of the reasons we went there is, is we wanted to uh, encourage and incentivize defection. And we tried to do that in the same way that we did that in Iraq. And, and it sounds from the book that, uh, that, that there was that impetus. I mean, certainly there was that feeling. But somehow we never got, you know, we never uh, organized to do that. Can you, can you talk about that? Sorry, which word? Affection? Is that um, de defection. 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 You wanted to encourage? Right. C clearly there was defections from Al-Qaeda. There was defections from the Taliban. There's defections you know, the very rational actor right. uh, uh, there in, uh, right. in Afghanistan. And so, you know, obviously we were trying to create a nice soft landing for all those folks, uh, and it never happened. Uh, I think, I, I want to talk about Iraq. I mean, Doug's an expert in Iraq, so you can ask him about that. But uh, about Afghanistan, um, you know, the question of defection is interesting because, and again, I refer to you to this piece about Jalal and Haqqani. Haqqanis were, for a period of time, the biggest foe, the biggest enemy of the United States probably in the world. Um, Jalal al Haqqani um, had been uh, a U.S. ally in the 1980s, and in 2001, when the U.S. invaded, they remembered that, and they w reached out to Haqqani to see if he could defect. And the terms of the deal were, at the time, that he would, um, you know, denounce the Taliban, and he would submit himself to the United States and, you know, don an orange jumpsuit and be in prison for a couple of months, uh, three months or six months, and then he would be released and be free to live, right? And you have to look at that from the point of view of some, from, from an Afghan point of view, particularly from somebody who, like Haqqani, who's a very highly respected, essentially he's a tribal owner now, you know, he's a very highly respected person in his area. And to, you know, don an uh, a orange jumpsuit, go into jail, and be there for three months, and then be released is, uh, is very humiliating, and, and so he didn't uh, concede to that. You know, those were the terms of defection at that time. There were some people who did ultimately, uh, even though they didn't realize that's what they were doing, Mullah Mutawakil, for example, the foreign, foreign minister, had, to, had done that, right? There are people who, ha who did do that, but for the most part, most people, this, is, this ran against Afghan culture. This is something very humiliating and embarrassing um, that they didn't want to sub sub uh, subject themselves to. I mean, Haqqani uh, and these people wanted to be dealt with as 
commensurate with their stature, which is that, you know, we'll come to a deal, you give me part of Loya Paktia, which is the area that he had controlled previously, and, you know, we'll call it, we'll call it even. That was what he wanted. Um, we, we had come in with a very punitive idea of what defection meant. You know, we did, there's a case which I described in my book of Mullah Obaidullah, who was a defense minister uh, of the Taliban. He had surrendered in January 6 of 2002. Him, the head of the religious police, Mullah Tarabi, who he was the guy who was like telling people to go and whip people. Right? They had all surrendered. They had all um, had a public ceremony where they went to the governor of Kandahar and said, we submit to you. We Here are our weapons. Here are our people. This is where we live. Come and check in, and check in on us every month. Just leave us alone. Don't kill us. And don't send us to you know, Guantanamo or whatever. And that's what happened. For, and so the deal was inked. And so they went to their homes. And Rumsfeld heard about this a couple of, uh, day later because it hit the press. And you can read about this. And he said, how dare you let these people live at home? They need to go and they need to be arrested and they need to be you know, processed, et cetera. That's what defection meant at the time. And that, that was part of the problem. And anyway, he, by the way, fled to Pakistan and um, rejoined the Taliban. And he became one of the leaders of the insurgency for six years. We had another question in the back. Yep, yeah, right here. Hi, uh, John Mueller from Ohio State and um, from Cato. I would like to go back to the first question. I came in a bit late. Maybe you already covered this, but the uh, uh, when the, qu the question is, what could we have done differently? And you make a very good case for the point that what we did is a spectacular failure. But you come up with this idea: basically, you should have built a stronger government and then sort of expanded it out, uh, which by a country that can't basically get the Washington D.C. schools to work. Uh, so the question is, and the correct answer is what we should have done differently is just simply not go in in the first place? Well, you know, my mom used to say that if you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. I think it's something that's, that's similar as here. If you can't invade a country and, uh, you know, help it, then you shouldn't invade at all. Well, that that's done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but you, you care to expand on that a little bit? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that we could actually, uh, that we could actually uh, implement all the things that I'm saying that we should do um, because there's so many levers to pull in in DC and in, in, in the United States overall. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, one of the fundamental problems of Afghanistan moving forward is the fact that the national government cannot actually accrue its own revenue. And this is a government that can't actually tax its own people. It's utterly reliant on a foreign power for its very existence. Okay, this is problematic and profoundly problematic on many levels, but the least of which means that we will be funding the <coughs> Afghan government in perpetuity. There's no plan in place to, 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 to allow the government to be sustainable, right? Yeah, uh, I think what would actually need to happen is we'd have to think about what would it take for the Afghan government to actually get to that stage where it could actually accrue its own revenue. And we have to look at history, what would happen in the majority of post-World War II, right? There's other countries, perhaps not as dysfunctional as Afghanistan, but there are other countries that are emerging from colonialism, emerging from all sorts of situations. One of the things they did was they, they allowed the state to become, or they enabled the state to become very, very strong through nationalization of the industries, through um, you know, having the state be the main sort of source of political and economic capital in, in, the, in the country. And so this means a, a paradigm shift away from our idea of thinking of privatizing everything, of, of having contracts. Let, let the Afghan state, state be the, the main employer of Afghan people. Let the Afghan state actually be the most important political and economic institution in the country. Then you'll see like, how the country will change. You know, people will shift because out of choice, even if they were supporting the Taliban, they'll sh shift out of necessity because you have to deal with the Afghan state if you want to make a living, if you want to live in the society. Right? I'm skeptical of that kind of thing. Nationalizing you know, all industries in Afghanistan and you know, pouring all money into the central state, cutting off all funding for these various actors outside the state, you know, um, de-emphasizing you know, de the, the periphery for the center. That runs counter to everything we've done in the last 13 years, but also runs counter to the ethos of the world in the last 20 years, I think. So I think it's unlikely to happen, but I think that's what should happen. I think that's the best shot at working. I mean, who, I don't know if anything's going to work, but I think, you know, I think what needs, uh, the end goal needs to be a strong Afghan state. It needs to be an Afghan state that can stand on its own without the U.S. propping it up. That's the first, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to like, uh, you know, Afghan Switzerland or whatever, right? That needs to happen. And so we need to think seriously about what we need to do to make that happen. And um, continuing to fund 
warlords and commanders and you know having two parallel systems with the CIA and the special forces having these power brokers in the countryside and having a weak state in the center with no end in sight, I don't think that's an answer. Up front here. Hi, my name is Ali Grieb and I'm with the Nation Institute. Um, so this book is, I mean, I know that you wrote this book because you saw that there was a, a space that needed to be filled that told the story of this war from um, Afghan eyes and from, you know, with a few notable exceptions and then some books about kind of biographies of major figures and so on. There hasn't been much narrative or long form journalism about actual, the, the lives of actual sort of, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say ordinary Afghans, but let's say not, you know, uh, major, major national figures that you would be reading about on a regular basis in our newspapers here. And uh, I know that you, well, yeah, I know that you set out to write this book in that way, mostly because you've told me about it as you were writing the book. But if you can just talk about, um, you know, you, I, I don't want you to like uh, 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 name names and, and shame your past editors and colleagues and country there, but just talk about the media environment and the way the war was covered. Uh, I, know, I know we've talked about how it, it was this, and you, and you alluded it today, to it today, about how it was covered mostly from Kabul, and it was tough for expats to get out, and not, every, not everybody had the advantage of kind of the olive skin and the ability to grow a killer hipster beard like you. And so just it talk about how though, the, the media easy. environment in the U.S. and how it looked at the war and what some of those struggles have been and the, the, that breach you attempted to fill with this book. Well, uh, I think there's two, uh, there's two challenges that the press corps face when they're covering Afghanistan, one, one of which is that so much of the country, particularly the most interesting areas for us, which is where the war is being fought, is not accessible. This is the Taliban's fault because they have this propensity to kidnap people who come into their areas. Um, so th this is the, the broad sort of structuring factor, which keeps a lot of Afghan journalists, I'm uh, sorry, uh, foreign journalists in Kabul. Uh, the second issue, which I alluded to before, is also, I think, a structuring factor, is that most people who are there are there because they're with major institutions and bureaus. and. And so there's no, not a real impetus to speak the language. Um, and I think that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, if I had shown up in 2007, 2008, and I, had, I could afford $150 a day for a translator or a fixer, I probably would have done so as well. And I would have never learned the language. And I would have missed out on a whole set of experiences that I uh, actually got. You know? And so I don't think that's actually the fault of the journalists who are there. Uh, with that being said, I, I think there is an unfortunate tendency amongst journalists, and I'm sure I've been guilty of this myself, uh, which is to, to be too, um, uh, too uncritical of official sources because, and, and not recognizing that official sources also have a, a dog in this fight, of course, right? Um, and you see this all the time when you know, people are reporting from Kabul and, and there's a, some story about 22 Taliban killed in some village somewhere. And, and we have no idea. Uh, and I, I, I learned this like, the hard way firsthand. There's, I have a very good friend of mine named Sabar Lal. And Sabar Lal, I had met him when I first landed in Afghanistan in 2008 um, because uh, I was in a bus station and you know, practicing my very terrible uh, Farsi Dari at the time. And he, he walked up to me and he, and he said, where are you from? What are you doing? <laughs> and, and I explained to him, I said, I'm a journalist. I'm from the United States. And he told me how his dream was to visit the United States and how like, he loved the American culture. And he had, he had, like, you know, he was reading, he had watched the Hollywood movies. He was a big fan of, of uh, American movies. What he didn't tell me at the time is he had spent like four years in Guantanamo. Uh, that came out later, I learned later, but uh, the reason why he had uh, gone to Guantanamo is because he, his commander uh, was, and I talk about him a little bit in the book, his name is Rahula Wakil. He was a major tribal elder in the Korangal Valley. The Korangal Valley was for many years the most dangerous part of Afghanistan, probably for a time the most dangerous area in the world for, for Americans. There's a movie called Restrepo, if you ever see that, it's about the Korangal Valley. Um, and this tribal elder, Wakil, was for many years uh, a member of the Northern Alliance, which if you remember were the, the guys that we were supporting in the 1990s. And uh, what happened was after we invaded in 2001, we had a group that had gone to the Korangal Valley or to that area. Uh, and um, 
set up a base. And you know, when you, if you think about what it means to set up a base, you get there, you actually need to get the gravel on the ground. You need to get the HESCOs up, right? You need to get some kind of structure up. So who, how do you do that? Well, the modern paradigm of doing it used to be that the military would do it themselves. But the modern paradigm is you, you outsource that. And so they've gone there and they tendered contracts to local Afghans saying, you know, whoever can build this stuff, you know, we'll give you money to do it. But it wasn't just any Afghans. It's not like there was a, like the internet or something you just put up in the middle of Korangal to say. Rather, you know, they connected with people who were able to come to them quickly, right? And so there's two groups. One was Wakil, who was related to my friend, and one was another, a rival group. Both of them were vying for contracts, but the rival group had a son who spoke English, so they got the contracts. And he was worried about m uh, Wakil and my friend Sabra Law, and so he said, those guys are Al-Qaeda. So both of them got sent to Guantanamo. That's how they ended up in Guantanamo. Um, so I, anyway, I had befriended him, and we had spent a lot of time together. He'd taken me up to Kunar province, uh, up to Korangal. He'd taken me to Nangarhar, to all these parts. of the, He took me into Pakistan. We had a lot of great times together. And then one day I read in the news that he was killed. Um, he was killed in a night raid in 2011, I believe. Um, and uh, I read it in the New York Times. Not the New York Times. I mean, New York Times has done great reporting, but sometimes, like, like I said, even I'm susceptible to this, but this, uh, this a tendency to accept official sources, I think, is really pernicious and is an example. Because I read it in the New York Times, and it said an Al-Qaeda fighter had been killed in Nangarhar province on this day. And I just read it like, you know, you read, read these reports all the time. And then all of a sudden, I got to the name. It said Sabar Lal. And my heart dropped because I was like, this can't be the same. My Sabar Lal. So I called the family, and I couldn't, get, uh, I couldn't get a hold of them. And so I actually got up and went to, to Jalalabad, which is near where he lived, which is like a four-hour drive from Kabul. And I got there. I went to his house. And I saw the people uh, um, in a mourning ceremony for him. And it turned out that some kind of I suppose, you know, I can't believe that this person is Al-Qaeda. I mean, like, how could he be friendly with me and we'd hang out all the time, he, you know, um, and all of a sudden they're accusing him of Al-Qaeda. I suspect it was part and parcel of the same rivalries that had continued earlier that had, ended up, that had sent him to Guantanamo. But if you look, if you Google his name, if you look up his name in the New York Times or anywhere else in LexisNexis, you won't find any of these mentions. You'll find, it says, this guy was an Al-Qaeda fighter or he's a suspected Al-Qaeda fighter. There's no other side to defend him because you know his family are illiterate. They're not people who could, could go and talk to, who can contact journalists and tell his side of the story. And, and that's entered into the record. Um, if any of the uh, my co uh, colleagues had gone there to Jalalabad, they could have talked, or at least they could have brought another side to it. And maybe they wouldn't have been in a position to adjudicate between the two sides, but they'd have said, okay, there is another side to this. Um, but the overall reliance on official sources, I think, has really hampered that. Um, Okay, one more question. Uh, Hugh Gustafson, I'm an anthropologist at George Mason University. I'm curious to know whether in the State Department, the military, the CIA, there were any people who understood the mistakes of interpretation the US government was making in real time, or was the US national security state uniformly misreading the situation? In real time, I think most people were misreading the situation. Now, I haven't talked to everybody, so I don't know. I don't know if Doug knows better than this. But like, in retrospect, I know that people had, after the book has been released, people have come to me and said, actually, you know, I thought this or I thought that. You know, um, there's a lot of people I spoke to who, who said that they suspected as such during the time. You know, it was 2002 was a difficult time. I mean, the, you think about the zeitgeist of the, in this country. It was retribution. It was, you know. The world is, it comes neatly packaged into two camps, and that we need to prosecute a war based on that idea. Um, I would, this is some, a question that I would actually like to find, understand better myself, and hopefully I can meet more people through the course of this book who can uh, let, um, uh, put some sh a light on this, because I, I don't know, but from my perspective, it seems that it was more of a uniform idea. I don't know if, Doug, if you know. I, you know I, I can't talk about the early days. We can have a comment. There, in later years, there were certainly some internal debates. Um, I can't speak to the you know, early years in Afghanistan. I wasn't there. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, take moderator's privilege to ask the last question. Actually, I want to follow up on your, uh, I'm assuming, friend's uh, question here on, uh, on the state of journalism. You know, when I uh, talk to other people who were in Afghanistan the same time you were, words like crazy, nuts, suicidal um, come up frequently. Um, 
you know, perhaps this is just, you know, jealousy from Kabul, but on the other hand, you know, riding around, you know, with a beard on a motorcycle in Uruzgan, since you're sitting here, I'm assuming you didn't do that in the Tangy Valley, um, despite reporting on, on that, but. I actually that, did, but. <laughs> okay, yeah. Don't, so, don't, so, don't try it at home. So. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm shocked that you're, like, still here to tell this story. Um, you know, how, how does a journalist go about getting these stories in places that are dangerous? I mean, I'm assuming you would not counsel a you know, nephew or young cousin of yours to, to go do this, um, that uh, you know, you know, his, you know, his mother or whoever that might be would, right. would have uh, serious <laughs> difficulties with you were you to advise that. So how do you suggest that journalists go about covering this in, in these war zones, in places where access is difficult, um, you know, and how much at risk is an incumbent for a journalist to take to get this story right? Well, I think a large dose of it in, in, my, in my history was, ex was uh, stupidity because uh, if I had known what I know now, I probably wouldn't have done a lot of the things that I did in 2008. If you were a Meister going to Tangy, you're stupid. You yeah, know? well, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't the smartest thing to do, and you know, you shouldn't try to do that. Uh, you know, I landed in the country in 2008, and I knew nothing about the place, and um, so, you know, and I didn't know anybody, I didn't know other foreign journalists, so I got the motorcycle, I had an African friend, he said, let's go, and that's where we went. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it was, it's not about as well. I, I don't do that now. I, I lived with the Taliban for like three weeks to, to like report on them in 2008. I would never do that now. Uh, I think the conflict has actually changed quite a bit since then. It's become much more disarticulated since then. You know, back, back in 2008, when I went with the Taliban at that time, in the Tangi, in fact, um, I had a letter from, at the time, the person who was a leader of the Taliban saying, this guy's a journalist, let him go, you know, <laughs> don't kidnap him, what's that, whatever. So I had this letter and I would portray it everywhere, I would show it everywhere I went, and, and so I was fine. Today, that letter wouldn't get me anywhere because the Taliban are so fragmented, they're so divided that, you know, fine, I can show that letter to one guy, but another guy might kidnap me. But it, generally speaking, I think speaking, you know, learning the language and taking time to get to know Afghans or wherever the country may be can yield enormous dividends. Um, as I found, uh, you know, I used to have, once a week in my place in Kabul, I used to invite travel elders from various places and feed them lunch, which is a very Afghan thing to do, is, you know, to like feed people lunch and have everybody sit around and just talk and um, you see what comes out of it. And not even, I wasn't even interviewing them at the time. We were just hanging out as such. You know, and they would tell stories and I would find interesting things. And I think, you know, that sort of approach, I think you will be surprised what you can get. You'll be surprised where you can go safely, perhaps not as safely as uh, I had actually been in 2008, but you could still go a lot of places um, that you couldn't have otherwise. Great. Fanaka, you, you picked up Dari. Did you learn Pashtun as well? Uh, conversational Pashtun, but I prefer to do interviews in Dari. Okay. But, Great. Once again, on uh, behalf of Anne-Marie Slaughter and Peter Bergen, we want to thank Anand Gopal for coming. Once again, the book is uh, No Good Men Among the Living. If you're here physically, there are copies outside that I'm sure he will uh, be happy to sign once you purchase them. Um, if you're at home, we recommend the Buy Now button from your favorite electronic bookseller. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.